Thank you for your blood. Thank you for your blood. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It's because of your blood that I know you, Lord. It's because of your blood that I am here. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. This past week, um, my, my grandmother passed away. Pastor Stephen's mother passed away. And we are all here because two people made an, a choice to write the blood of Jesus on their heart, to apply the blood of Jesus onto their heart, and to say yes and obey the call of Jesus on their life. All of us are standing here because of somebody's obedience, because of Ginger Beerman and William Beerman's obedience. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I just want to thank God so much. I want to thank God for the power, the power that, that there is in applying the blood to our heart. Thank you, Jesus, for that blood that mends every heart it mends every pain. And when they fell in love with Jesus, they fell in love hard. And they told everybody that they knew. Hallelujah. You know, for Christmas, my grandma used to give me these, these, little, um, these little plaques. She would laminate these plaques with scriptures on them. And she'd say, put these around your room. And, you know, the Bible talks about applying the blood, applying the word in your home, above your, door, above your doorway above every entrance and every entrance of my mind every entrance of my heart every entrance of my home has been applied with the blood of Jesus yes. and because of that my house serves the Lord hallelujah and they did that in their in their lives they saw their children serve the Lord there are people all over the world that know Jesus because of a couple people in a, in a town that had maybe a thousand people decided to declare the name of Jesus and start a small little church and now there are people all over the world that know Jesus because of that and you don't I don't think you guys understand how powerful it is that if you if you just listen to the call of Jesus on your life if you do the small things the things that seem so minuscule but what an impact what an impact hallelujah 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 but there's nothing that can get in the way of that. There's no sickness. There's no depression. There's no anxiety. Apply the blood to your mind. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I just want to thank Jesus for his blood. 
I'm applying the blood of Jesus, that freedom to my mind. I'm applying it to my heart. In Jesus' name, I'm letting these words flow out of my lips. Hallelujah, hallelujah. The devil has no place in my home. The devil has no place in my heart. The devil has no place in this church. He has no place in New Life Church. Hallelujah. This is an anointed place. Hallelujah. We speak that out in Jesus' name. We apply the blood. I apply the blood to everybody that stands in this room in Jesus' name. And I boldly declare that you are sanctified in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Allow the blood to sanctify your heart. Allow the blood to sanctify your mind and write it on your heart that I will obey the call of Jesus on my life. I will obey the call of Jesus on my life. Hallelujah. I live as a victor in every single moment of my life. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord, because the call is so much greater. The call is so much greater than my pain. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. And there to my heart, was the blood applied glory to his name there to my heart and there to my heart was the blood applied glory Let's praise his name, hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Glory, glory, hallelujah. We are victorious, hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Death has no sting, fear has no power, hallelujah. Fear has no power, hallelujah. Hallelujah. If these things are overtaking me, it's not because Jesus' sacrifice wasn't good enough. It's because I'm not taking my place. Hallelujah. So I take up my place. I take authority. I stand in Jesus' name. And I say, I will obey the call. I will obey the call. No negative thoughts can come against me. No devil in hell can come against me. Hallelujah. Because there are people, there are souls on the other side that need, need what I have. There are souls on the other side that need every, what every one of you has in Jesus' name. So we take hold of that. We thank you for that, Jesus. Hallelujah. If there is anybody that is going through a struggle in their mind, they're struggling with depression or anxiety, I just want you to lift up your hands. Hallelujah. The Lord is healing you. The Lord is working on your mind. The Lord is giving you deliverance in Jesus' name. It has no power. Hell has no power over you. Hallelujah. 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 The devil may be the God of this world, but Jesus overcame the world. Hallelujah. He has overcome. He has overcome, and he has seated you right next to him. Hallelujah. You are seated in heavenly places. Hallelujah. You have the authority to come against these things. So Father, I just pray, I pray and believe that every negative thought, every thought of suicide, every thought of, of less than, it has no place in their minds. It has no place in this church, hallelujah. It has no place in their homes, hallelujah. We worship you, we glorify you, hallelujah. And we stand victorious. Let's just sh lift up a shout of praise, hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for your blood. Thank you for your blood. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I don't know. I feel like there's more. I feel like there's more. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Let's just pray in the spirit. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. 
a new anointing, a new grace, a new glory will fall upon this church. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Because of their obedience. Hallelujah. It'll be passed down just like Elijah to Elisha. Hallelujah. There's a new anointing. There's a new grace over our pastors. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And because of that, as we serve underneath them, we'll be taken to a new place. Hallelujah. We thank you for that, Lord. We thank you for that. We thank you for the peace that passes all understanding. As we go on into a new, a new thing, hallelujah, there's peace that covers us. There's peace that covers us. In Jesus' name, hallelujah. Hallelujah. We praise you, Father. We praise you, Lord. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise God. The presence of the Lord is very heavy here this morning. As we were praying before the service, I just saw in the spirit, it was like God was just, he dropped like a blanket over this place. And it's just, it's the anointing like he's saying. There's an anointing in this place. You know what the anointing does? It breaks yokes. It sets us free. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I want to just share something with you that came to me a couple weeks ago when I went to help uh, with camp meeting up in, in uh, Oklahoma. I felt like in prayer beforehand, the Lord said there's a shift in the winds of the Spirit that are getting ready to take place. And I won't go into all the details, but the Lord showed me and revealed back when my, my husband was outside and he was mowing the grass and he ran in the house real quick. And I, I'm like, what are you doing? He said, there was a shift in the winds and I could feel it while I was mowing the yard. And he said, I knew it was, something was happening. We looked out the back of our window, and there was this huge tree that uprooted on its own. <laughs> it just came up out of the roots. And the Lord said, there is a coming together of the former and the latter rains, and that shift in the winds of the Spirit is moving things out without you even trying. There's some things that have needed to be uprooted in your heart, in your life, in maybe from a past, some, some decisions, some things maybe that you're dealing with right now. I don't know what it is. You know what it is. But whatever that is, right now there's a shift going on. And the Spirit of God is lifting that thing up out by its roots, setting you free today. Hallelujah. Whatever it is you've been struggling with, I want to encourage you right now. Lift your hands because there's power in your praise. There's power in worship. And so, Father, we thank you right now for that shifting of the winds of the Spirit that you're uprooting. You're taking up those things, those addictions, those, that thought life, that negative thought life, that, those things in our body that we've been struggling with. God, maybe it's purpose. So we've tried to figure out what our purpose is, God. What is our place? What is your plan, Lord? Those things are shifting around, and you're setting in motion the things that need to take place for this hour. There is a momentum that's taking place in the Spirit, and we just step into that place right now by the Spirit, and we thank you that just like an alignment with your back, when you go get your, your back uh, straightened out for the chiropractor, there's an alignment taking place right now. And it's not by might, it's not by power, it's not by your own strength, it's not by your own mental capacity, it's not by your emotional uh, ideals or your emotionalism, but it's by the Spirit that it's taking place right now and in that place. It's a place of refuge and strength and comfort and a release. Hallelujah. Praise God. We, I was talking to somebody last week. There's a release. She said, I keep hearing the word release. There's a release. There's a, some of y'all need some release from some things. So say it with your mouth right now. Declare it. I release that. I release it in Jesus' name up from the roots. I release that from the history, from the past. I'm not bound to hereditary curses. Jesus paid the price. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Somebody needs to lift up some praise in this place. Somebody needs to open your mouth and declare God's goodness. Somebody needs to say something about how awesome your God is. Hallelujah. Breaking the barriers. 
breaking the barriers. There's been a lot of negative words put out, and those words have put out some negative barriers. So we break those negative barriers right now with the power of God. Hallelujah. I've got the life of God in me. I've got his life, his nature, and his ability. I've got the life of God in me. Hallelujah. Can you say that? I've got the life of God in me. I've got the life of God in me. I've got his life, his nature, and his abilities. I've got the life of God in me. Amen. Do you believe that? I'm going to tell you something. If you don't believe it, it's true anyways. And if you'll just keep saying it over and over, you'll start to believe it. <laughs> Amen. Because out of the abundance of your heart, your mouth's going to start speaking. Amen. So my heart believes that the life of God is flowing in me. My heart believes I've got his life, his nature, and his ability. My heart believes that nothing is impossible. My heart believes that I'm free. I'm free. Are you free this morning? Ha, ha. Somebody needs to laugh a little bit. Ha, ha, ha. Put on some praise on purpose. Y'all know, we've talked about this before, that when your, your body doesn't even know when you fake laugh, but there's a reaction that happens when you even fake laugh. There's a, a force that takes place in your system where, you know, we, we know the word says that the joy of the Lord is our how many need some strength today? Well, I think you need to put on some joy. How many know that there's medicine? Mary Hart do a good like medicine. How, if you're dealing with something in your body, maybe you just need to put on some joy. We put the joy on the back shelf, I think, sometimes. So, And you think, oh, I'm just not going to be fake. Well, all you're doing, I love this. I was with a singing group, and she said, I was young and didn't know, and she said, you need to show some joy. And I said, well, I don't want to be fake. She said, all you're doing is letting what's on the inside come out. So we've got the life of God in us. Don't you think it's full of joy? <laughs> Don't you think it's full of strength? It's full of ability? What does the nature of God look like? It is, is it downcast? Is despairing, sad, hopeless? No. No, the life of God is full of joy and freedom and a release in the spirit. Hallelujah. So let's do that right now. Look at the person next to you. This will help you. This will encourage your joy. And laugh. Don't laugh at them. Laugh with them. Just say, I'm not laughing at you. I'm laughing with you. you laugh with me, will you? Ha, ha, ha. Ha, 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 ha. Ha, 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 ha. Can you, you can already feel it. Press in a little bit. Ha, 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 ha. I know you think it's crazy, but it's working anyways. Hallelujah. We're going to give you about 60 seconds to meet somebody. Reach out. Love somebody. Shake somebody's hand. Give them a holy five. Laugh in their face a little bit. Put on some more joy. All right, everyone, as you make your way back to your seats, so good to see everybody today. I'm so thankful for our worship team. Don't they do an awesome job? Let's give it up for the worship team. Thank you for pouring out. I know it's not easy. All right. If you're a guest with us, we'd like to welcome you today to New Life Church. You should have been giving a, a card whenever you came in. If not, there should be one in the front there. Um, it's a connections card. We want you to fill that out, turn it into our Next Steps booth. We'd love to meet you, give you a gift, welcome you to our church. Today, after service, we will be having our young adults group. Woohoo! We're going to be meeting at Happy Walk. 
So nobody else is allowed to go to Happy Walk because only the cool kids are going to be there. No. Um, <laughs> Hunter says, and if you go, don't talk to us. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Uh, you can totally talk to us. It's all good. Um, <laughs> that made me laugh. Um, all right. The, this week, we're going to have Zoom prayer. It meets Monday through Wednesday. If you need the link for that, see Pastor Lindsay after service. She'll give you the link. We also have our daily Bible reading. It's in the app. If you don't have the app, download it. There's a lot of goodies in there. We have our um, women's group in there that does a lot of chatting, and I think the men's have a group. The men have a group, but I think they talk about food more than anything else. Um, and then Wednesday night, we're going to be meeting for Bible study at 7 p.m. Next Sunday, mark your calendars. Uh, we are going to have guest speakers Scott and Sue Bierman. They're going to be here Sunday morning. It's going to be an awesome time. Come on out for that. And then coming up is our Ladies Bloom event. It's going to be October 1st, and registration is open today. So get on our website and uh, make sure you register. Bloom, October 1st. We always have a great time. Thank you so much. I have on a backpack like Dora the Explorer, but... Um, we have been waiting and waiting to see who our guest speaker is for Bloom. So if you are interested, we actually have a little video to show who our guest speaker for Bloom will be, if you guys can show that. Well, we're so excited. I don't know if you can tell by the sweetie, sweetie, but she is actually Pastor Steve's sister. But more importantly, she is an anointed speaker, pastor. They um, are connected with Kenneth Hagen Ministries. Um, they currently are over Rama, Australia, um, and they are doing an amazing work. They've been uh, missionaries in um, Italy and Singapore and um, different places and they are currently in Australia and so we are very blessed to have them here for a very short while um, so you really you won't want to miss out on this it's going to be an amazing time this year so make sure you mark your mark your calendars and register in the event we do have limited spaces so we want to make sure everybody who's here is able to be a part but not only that but we also want to invite some ladies amen thank you very much Hallelujah. So excited. Who's, who's ready to do the offering? Yeah. Trying to be buddy this morning. Yeah. <laughs> he does it so great. I don't know. Yeah. I have a little scripture here. 2 Samuel um, chapter 24, verse, verse 24. Uh, perhaps many of us know the story of the King David, uh, one of the choices that he, he made a decision to, to count his fighting men. And God was not so happy with that. And I like what uh, David said here because uh, God made him uh, three choices to choose from. And he, one of the choices that he made was that, uh, that he's better for him to fall under God's arm than being, uh, being, being under man's arm. Because he knew that the grace of God was there for him. God, with God's mercy, God was uh, able to forgive him for all his mistakes. So God told him to, med to, to offer an offering. And uh, what he said here in the verse 24, and uh, he was going to buy a threshing, uh, thresh a threshing floor uh, where he was going to build the altar. And uh, the guy by the name of Ol uh, Aruna, uh, who is the owner of the threshing floor, was ready to give it to David for free. Say, um, you can build the altar for free here for the Lord. 
But David said, no, I will not do so. I, uh, I would like to buy it from you. He said, but the king replied to Arona, no, I insist on paying you for it. I will not sacrifice to the Lord my God burnt offering that cost me nothing. That's so powerful. So powerful. How we remember the goodness of God when we think about what the Lord has done for us. We have to give him the best because everything that we have all comes from him. There's nothing that we can, we can hold on to that, you know, that he doesn't deserve. He deserves everything. Every little thing belongs to him. So David understood this. He said that I'm not going to take anything for free. I'm going to pay it. Just give me numbers and I will buy it and build the altar for the Lord. Because he understood who God was for him. Amen. So I would like us to all stand up this morning with your offering ready. So we can all declare, we, we are sowing into the kingdom of God. We are going, we don't know if you can just pray and open for, uh, for God to open up your, our eyes to see where our money, our finances are going. You will be surprised how lives are changed, transformed through your resources, our talents, everything. Because it's not only about just our resource, financial giving, but it's all the time, the effort that you're putting into the kingdom of God. It makes a big difference. Hallelujah. Let's all stand and declare this in the name of Jesus. This is my seed. I sow into the kingdom of God. I sow because I love God. I want to see new life church to do what God has called us to do. I believe that as I sow my seed, it shall be given unto me. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and you run over. It shall come back to me in many ways. I thank you, Lord, for the great opportunities coming my way. I thank you that the windows of heaven are opening because of my obedience to sow my seed. I thank you, Lord, for the favor of God upon my life and the grace to prosper as you have promised in your word. I also express thanks, Lord, that you rebuke the devourer for my sake. I proclaim that you rebuke sickness, lack, confusion, disease, and I am free now from heels and bandage and ill effects. Father God, we thank you for the grace to be able to give, Father God, to sow into your kingdom. We thank you because the windows of heaven is opening, Father God, because of our obedience. We thank you because those resources are traveling, oh God, to touch lives, Father God. And we thank you, Father God, because you are going to be glorified. We give you glory, praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. How many are blessed this morning? Amen. Well, I'm flying solo today. <laughs> I'm not the pastor. I'm pa Pastor Kim, but if you don't know, if you're visiting with us, Pastor Steve will be back with us next week, as you've already heard. So please come back again. We'd love to have you visit with us again. We're so grateful for what God's doing in this church. We are seeing growth. We are seeing miracles. We're seeing people come to Jesus and it's exciting, amen? It's harvest time, amen? I was just listening to, if you know who Jerry Savelle is, I was listening to him speak a couple weeks ago, and he was talking about how we're in a time right now where there's such a, a momentum and things are moving faster. Acceleration, I think, was his word, and I've been getting that same word in my spirit. And he said, it's such a time right now, I want to encourage you with the seed that you've sown, because... He said that the, the harvest he was seeing, his grandfather was a, a farmer, and he said they have a saying, I guess the, the farmers have a saying when it's time to plant seed, that the ground is hot, the ground, the soil is hot. He said, I'm telling you now, before I even get the soil out of my hand to give it to somebody, God's already getting it back to me. So I want to encourage you with that, and we're seeing that in our own lives, and it's encouraging. But if you don't put anything in, then you don't get anything back, right? <laughs> what you sow is what you reap. Praise God. So let's be reaping a whole bunch because it's time for the kingdom of heaven to, to be the harvest to come and for us to be a part of that right now. Hallelujah. Well, I'm not speaking today. Uh, I, we asked my brother, in case you didn't know, Buddy is my little brother. <laughs> and he's, uh, he's, he's my little brother. I say that little. But he, he's seven years younger than I. And... Um, so when we were, uh, I'm going to just kind of precede him a little bit, and I'm sure he'll have something to say about it. 
But um, so, you know, when we were probably, I think it was 13, 11, and 5, Buddy was 5. We have a sister in between. Uh, you know, we were kind of on our own for a little bit. When my dad moved on to heaven, my mom was working. We were home alone, and I was the boss. And and I, and I you know, kind of kept things running with the house and dinners, and they didn't like it because I was bossy, and I told them what to do. <laughs> So I joke with him and tell him I taught him everything he knows. I, I didn't, but, you know, I have to say that. But he's going he's gonna to give us the word today. I believe that he's anointed. I believe, you know, like what Hunter was saying earlier, that there's two people that have obeyed God. Well, there was two people on my side that obeyed God as well. And those two people came together from those four people. And that's what we're doing today. We're, we're affecting the kingdom for such a time as this. I believe Buddy is uh, anointed by God. He has a word in season, and he's bold. And so I want to encourage you right now, don't look at Buddy as, as the guy who receives the offering every Sunday. But I want you to look to him as a minister and a gos- of the gospel of truth. And I want you to put a draw on the anointing that's on the inside of him because he's got something to give to you today from the Holy Spirit. Of course, we look to him, the author and the finisher of our faith. We don't look to man. But I want you to put a draw on what he's got on the inside. It'll be good, I promise you. Are you ready? ready. Say, I'm ready. ready. All right. Oh, let the kids go. Amen. How many of y'all excited to be here this morning? JP, you ask it a second time. How many of y'all excited to be here this morning? And that gets them thinking a little bit more. That's all it was. That's all it is. You did a great job, JP. Well, well, I will say, uh, with all that she said, um, I did see a Fiero this morning that reminded me of you. A Fiero. Y'all remember the Fieros from the 80s? It was like Pontiac's way to make a Ferrari, but like a half scale. Yeah, it's like a wannabe Ferrari. She had one. Yeah, red. It was really pretty. I thought it was a really cool car. You know, when I was a kid, it was fun. Yeah, and then I found out my sister doesn't know how to drive on black ice. We went round and round in this little thing. It was not fun. I don't like Fieros anymore. That's all I could remember uh, seeing that Fiero this morning was I had a flashback of spinning. I got a little dizzy this morning on the way into church. But we also took it on a trip up to South Bend. Can you imagine that, going from Tulsa to South Bend? It's like 16 hours of driving in this itty-bitty car. And I, I still was pretty big size when I was in middle school. And I'm not even sure where we would put the luggage, because I don't even think there's a place to put the luggage. I think we were like, it was mixed in between us kind of thing. It was really un- inconvenient. But yes, she was the boss, round and round. <laughs> I learned a lot from my big sister. You don't break on black ice is what I picked up off that one. So thank you. There's a lot of good lessons. Well, if you don't mind, I want to share. I like um, to tell stories. So I'd like to share a story, but also kind of, I always find that the the journeys in life kind of lead you to, um, at least for me, the journeys in life kind of lead me to lessons to be learned. God teaches me lessons through journey. Anybody else get that? I know you do. I've heard a lot. And I saw, I saw a really cool Instagram with a baby inside of a pen, and they put a goat inside of the pen, and the baby was screaming at a certain frequency, and the goat did the same frequency, and the baby just stopped and looked like, you stole my thunder. I thought of you, though. Just because I know you're, I thought you would enjoy that. I didn't know how to get it to you, though. It was really funny. But anyway, I get uh, stories. I get a lot of stuff from stories and experiences and journeys, and I'm sure you do, too. Sometimes you don't pay attention. It's there for you, but... We have to pick it up sometimes and, and realize it. Um, before I do that, though, this morning was great, right? Yeah. Praise and worship was great. Did you all know uh, Vince Gill and Amy Grant joined us this morning? Yeah, you didn't notice that, did you? That's great. That's great. Yeah, there was a little Vince Gill in the background in the middle of all that. We've had some fun this morning. And so the part-time audio guy that I am has been working in the back trying to get you all to where you can see stuff and hear stuff and And also the streaming so they can hear stuff. But if they couldn't hear it at the beginning, they can now. So you can text them, say it's live, it's good, they should be all right now. But uh, there was something that came across because I kind of went around the whole setup and did a kind of a makeshift setup. And somehow or another, uh, some music came up with Vince Gill. And so right at the end of the, (laughs) right at the end of praise and worship, I'm like, what is that? Ryan and I look at each other, what is that? 
I'm like, I don't know. There's some music going on. We look over at David, and he opens up the computer, and I was like, pull up that. Pull. Vince Gill, turn it off. Turn it off. I'm not sure what he's singing, but it's not probably appropriate for what we're doing here. So sorry about that. If I'm not perfect in every regard. Is anybody perfect in here? Go ahead and raise your hand. We'll make fun of you. Is she, Levi? Is she really? <laughs> well, let's pray. Let's get started with prayer. That's probably the best approach to do. Um, what are you all laughing? That's, prayer's not funny. It's serious. No, I'm serious. We can pray. Let's get started with that, and let's just let God kind of uh, lead us through today. Amen? Father God, we thank you for this opportunity. You've created us for a purpose, Father God. You've created us for this, this time and this uh, place. And Father God, we thank you for what you're doing inside of us today. We thank you that you're creating in us a new image. And we open ourselves up to you, Father God. I open myself up to you. Be, let me be a channel for you, Father God. Let your words, your thoughts, your comments, your way of building us come through me, Father God. And let us, let us have ears to hear and let our hearts be open so that we may change and become more like you and through just even this next few minutes, Father God, we thank you for it. And let it be something that is pliable in our life that we can use and share with others so that others get to know you, understand your love, and your glory can come from it. In Jesus' name, amen. So I want to, uh, I just got a couple pictures. If you don't mind, I'm going to share this, this uh, story. And I'm so sorry Larry's not here because I'm going to talk about him. So we'll record it somehow or another. Somewhere in here there's a paper. Um, can you pull up that first slide? Let's look at that first uh, slide. So a couple pictures. Y'all remember the old days when you had the slide projectors and you go through the slides and you'd be like, people like, I want to show you my pictures. And the person presenting the pictures were more passionate about than the people that were sitting there. So I took that into consideration. I really narrowed it down from 250, just about 180. So we'll be here for a little bit, but I think you'll really appreciate it. Yeah. <laughs> Not really. It's really short. I promise. But, um, to the paper. Yeah, it's really pretty, isn't it? So a couple weeks ago, um, uh, uh, Cody and, and Luke, so Cody's my son, Luke's my son-in-law, got a chance to go up to Alaska uh, to go on a fishing trip. And so I got a couple pictures. I used my pictures in my own slide deck, so it was kind of cool. I do a lot of leadership meetings, and I did a leadership meeting this past week. And of course, I have leadership principles from this. So I used my own pictures. It was kind of cool because I didn't have to buy them. You know, when you present, you have to buy pictures. I didn't have to buy my own pictures. I got to just pull them and use them. So it was kind of fun in that regard. And there's some really pretty pictures here. But we got a chance a couple weeks ago to go on this, this trip. And um, it was, you know, one of those once-in-a-lifetime type of trips, something that you look forward to. Fantastic trip. You got to experience and see things that you've never experienced and, and seen things before. And, uh, and, like, I've taken aptitude tests and things of that nature. And I score really high on um, um, trying to do stuff. Uh, Adventure, thank you. I almost had Sandra up here speaking with me today, and it really would have been helpful, but she was working the kids' class. <laughs> working the kids' class. How's that working right now? Kids doing okay? <laughs> They're doing great. Anyway, I score really high on adventure, so I was really looking forward to this, uh, you know, getting a chance to go out there and trying something different, something I've never done before. I love to fish. My son loves to fish. I think Luke had fished. Um, so we had a, <laughs> hey Luke, um, <laughs> I think that was true. Uh, we had we had a great experience though in going out there and trying this. So it was, it was kind of an adventure. So we're getting ready to go on this adventure, and so, you know, I, I put this. You know, life's journeys uh, uh, continually growing from your experience. And like I said, every opportunity I can, whether it's a a trip like this, or whether it's a work experience, or whether it's you know, something at home or whether it's something with my wife or whatever. I learn from stuff and I grow from, from those experiences and I'm always maturing in those areas. And so I found, you know, right off the bat, this is an opportunity for me to mature in, in some ways. So we, we get prepared and I'll talk about some of the preparation we did and all that, but we get on this trip and um, we fly in to Ketchikan. If you guys know where Ketchikan, you probably heard of it, Ketchikan, Alaska. And then from Ketchikan, we're supposed to take this um, little plane, a uh, little float plane, they call it a beaver, so it's like made in the 50s, literally made in the 50s, beaver that it, you fly about 100 miles and then you land on the water and you're at this place. This place we're going to stay at is like a floating cabin system. In fact, 
um, built in Alaska did an episode, like eight episodes on them, and their, their big main building that they built out there. But it's floating. It's like massive pontoons all aligned together with these floating cabins. It's really cool and kind of back in a cove, real peaceful. And so we're taking this, you know, this, um, this float plane out there. Larry has a great idea that we'll, we'll take these beavers because they're a little bit more edgy and scary. So, you know, kind of up the adventure. Am I right? I'm right. So, he, you know, because normally they have a commercial float plane that fits like, you know, 11 people. It's bigger. It's nicer. It's newer. It has instruments. You know, you can read. <laughs> Larry's like, no, let's take the, uh, the beaver planes. They're like older. They don't have instruments. They fly by sight. Maybe we'll get there. And then, and then he goes on to tell the story of, like, when you're taking off and you're going across, you go down the channel and you go over the mountain pass. And as you go over the mountain pass, look down because one of the beavers didn't make it and you can still see the wreckage. <laughs> this is why Larry should be here because Melanie could elbow him a couple times. This was our guide, by the way. Larry was our guide. That's always fun to hear those kinds of stories before you get on the beaver plane. So we get to catch a can. And we spend the night, well, here, let me back it up even on the spending the night at Ketchikan. Because, you know, when you go to Alaska, people are always like, well, did you see eagles? And did you see whales? And did you see bears? And did you see, you know, everybody kind of asked, did you see all those things? Well, that night we stay at Ketchikan because you never know what the weather's going to be like. So in Ketchikan, as we're sitting there, actually, Melanie's son was there. Melanie's son and his friend comes in. This is late at night, like 1130. They're coming into the foyer. We just happen to be in the foyer getting some water, my son and I. And he comes into the foyer, and he's like, hey, uh, ma'am, there's, um, there's a bear in the hallway. You might want to go get the bear. And these two ladies were like, ah, again? And they just, like, walk on down the hallway, and it turns into this comic hour of these two girls chasing this bear. And the bear goes upstairs to the second floor. This bear can climb, bears can climb stairs pretty easy, guys. And, and we're all just sitting there watching it video and it going, is this really happening? And then they come down. The girls come down. They're like, you chased it the wrong way. I told you when we do this, you do it this way. And we're like. This is a normal occurrence. So I got to see a bear in the hotel going through the hallways. So whoever was on the second floor, I guarantee you, if they opened the door and that bear was coming out, they were passing out because that hallway was really small. So it was, we saw a bear. But then uh, the next day, we, we wake up, and the weather, sure enough, it's foggy. And remember what I said, we're going to fly on planes that don't have instruments, so you can only fly by sight. <laughs> Adventure. <laughs> Here we go. So um, we, we have a little bit of uh, delay uh, in getting out, and then it kind of reworks itself. Larry does his magic, and then all of a sudden, next thing you know, we're taking off. But it's still foggy, so we're, we're taking off. But we can see at least the water area. We can't get over the mountain pass because it's too foggy. So we, just, we, we decide we're going to go down the waterway, the channel, for a while because uh, the pilot could at least see that. So we get in, and this plane is the coolest thing. And, and Luke, uh, my son-in-law, is you know, into aerospace engineering and He's a mechanical, so he super enjoyed it. They put him in the cockpit with the, the pilot, which is great, except for there are controls over there that can actually control the plane, too. So we're like, Luke, keep your feet off of stuff and keep your hands off of stuff, and we're good. Um, but we had a good time. We went down, and we landed just fine, and then we had to take a, a, a car across the island because we couldn't fly over the island. We took a car across the island, uh, and then we got in a boat, and then the boat took us the rest of the way. So it was kind of like, Planes, trains, and automobiles, except we didn't have a train. We had a boat. So it was fun, though. We had a blast doing it. We got to see different parts of, and I will tell you this, the roads on that little island are better than most roads here. They were amazing. But we, we got to see some different things and, and kind of get in there. But the part that we get on the boat, and I really promise I have some scriptures here, too. But when we get on the boat and we're going to the place, we have a nice little boat ride. As we're coming into the, the sound, this place is called Sea Otter Sound. When we come into the sound, and the sound opens up to the ocean. So it's like here's the sound, and then there's like Japan. And so we're in the sound. And as we go to the sound, you know, all the, the, we have two boats. And the, our, our guy who's kind of driving the boat, the captain of our boat, is like, this little area right here that you see, you see that area? It's called Clump Island. He's like, Clump Island is the most important thing you can remember out of everything you hear because Clump Island is literally across from the lodge. So if you see Clump Island, you just know you have to turn and you go straight to the lodge. That's how you find your way home, Clump Island. You guys got that, Clump Island? And I'm like, yeah, no problem. I got it. That's not that big of a I mean, it's, you know, we can see it. It's not a big deal. Well, I'm learning, right? So part of the journey, I'm, I'm starting to understand that literally the climate changes and the fog comes in and, and you, you, you do need a point of reference to find home. But even when we got to the, 
the facility, the first thing they did is they took us out and they showed us the sound, like took us on a boat ride and kind of took us on a tour. And uh, once again, the guy went by Clump Island. He's like, this is the most important thing. You got to remember Clump Island. Clump Island is your way home. And so I'm like, all right, I got it. Man, everybody's like stuck on Clump Island. I get it. We're, we'll find our way home. But you can go to the next slide. This is important because I think, you know, when we're on a, on a journey like this, when you're on any kind of journey, it's important for you to know True North. You all know what True North is? There's been lots of books, lots of leadership lessons on True North. But True North is, is that point of reference on the earth that is absolute truth. It doesn't change. It's constant. It's continual. And so whenever you're in a journey, this is the fun part. I was telling Sandra about some of the stuff I was going to speak to. Whenever you're on a journey, if you're going out in the wilderness, you're checking your compass to make sure you're aligned to the direction according to true north. And you're checking it. I said, you check it often. You know, you check it every once in a while. She's like, how, like every six months? Or, and I'm like, man, if you, check it, if you check it every six months, you're lost. You're dead. You're, you, you haven't made it. Because you, you, because you had, she was testing me. That's what she, she just said. But you have to check yourself on your journey to find out where you're going, what's going on, what's taking place, am I still going, where's my truth, and where am I to the truth, and how, how consistent is that truth for me in my life? Because if I didn't have a true north, if I didn't have, if I had something else as a point of reference, what happens when the fog moves in? Oh, it changes everything, doesn't it? It's a, it's a little harder to see when the fog moves in. So, so it's a really cool, so I have this scripture, Isaiah, I love this scripture. I've mentioned this scripture before, like the building uh, 30 Rock, 30 Rockefeller Center in New York City has this scripture on it. If you didn't know that, the architects put it on the, on the building. Just a really cool scripture. But, you know, he will, and he will be the stability of your times, abundance of salvation, wisdom, knowledge, and the fear of the Lord is Zion's treasure. The fear of the Lord. God is our true north compass. He's our absolute He's our consistency. He's something that we can depend on. He doesn't change. He's always there for us. So in our lives, whatever your journey is, okay, whatever your journey is, you have to have God. You have to have the fear of God in your life. I love this. Um, I, I promise not to put up a bunch of scriptures, but I will say a bunch of scriptures if that's okay. And if you're taking notes, I will tell you this, that you can hear someone say something and you'll retain it 20% of the time. If you uh, hear it and write it down, it's a lot higher. It's like 50, 60% of the time. If you hear it, write it down, and then repeat it later today, you will remember it 80% of the time. So I encourage you not just to listen to the story. Stories help kind of retain things too, but listen to the story, but also write down. I only have like four or five points for you. It's not that big of a deal. You're not going to be writing a bunch. You're not going to run out of ink. You're not going to need but one page. Really simple, but just write down a few points and write down these key scriptures. I think they'll, they'll be something for you to meditate on. I think it's helpful. Uh, in your in your journey, whatever it may be today, whatever is going on this week, whatever is taking place, you all have your own journey right now. So number one for me, the most important thing is once again establish a point of truth, and God is the fear of the Lord is that truth. It also says this in Proverbs one seven, good scripture to write down. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. Proverbs has a ton of stuff on fear. I love this and Psalms. As well, Psalms 19.9 says that the fear of God is enduring forever. Psalms 34.11 says it can be taught. We can be taught the fear of God. Psalms 111.10 says it is the beginning of wisdom. Proverbs 2.5 says it leads to the knowledge of God. Proverbs 10.27 says it prolongs life. That's all right. I'll take that. How many of y'all want that supplement? That's a good supplement to take. Proverbs 14, 26 says, it provides confidence and security. Proverbs 19, 23 says, it leads to life, satisfaction, rest, and safety. This is just point one. I'm good with that. I could end it right here probably. Proverbs 22, 4 says, it provides riches, honor, and life. Awesome. There's greatness in understanding the fear of the Lord. If you, if you get anything out of today's message, get that. Go dig into that. Dig into those scriptures. Think about, meditate on those, and ask yourself, how is the fear of the Lord your true north compass in your current journey? How are you using it? How does it apply? Meaning, if you're in a financial situation and you're having troubles or issues or concerns, what's the first thing you do? Do you go to God? Or do you try to figure it out? Do you go to God? Or do you go to your bank? Do you go to God or do you go to your work? Do you go to God 
Or do you fight with your spouse? That's what we're supposed to do. If we have a health issue, what's the first thing we do? Do you go to the doctor? Do you go to your spouse? Do you complain? What comes out of your mouth? What's the first word that comes out of your mouth? So if you have a true north direction, a true absolute in your life that always helps keep you on track, no matter what obstacles come about, no matter what fog, financial health, you know, relationships, anything like that, no matter what fog comes about, there's always a true north in our life that helps keep us on the right path. Anyway, once again, those are some cool scriptures. Did you guys get those? Those are really good ones to go back to. Proverbs is awesome. The fear of the Lord is definitely my true north. All right, so we have our true north on this fishing trip. We have Clump Island as our true north. But the other thing that was given to us that was super important was a Garmin GPS. So we had a fish tracker as well as a tracker on the boats. Super important. So we're in this big sound, big area. You know, it could literally take you a good 45 minutes to get to one side to the other. And then if you broke the rules like Larry, you could go outside the limit. You could keep on going to Japan for a while. Uh, so you could, you, you could really go a lot further than 45 minutes is all I was saying. I was kind of wondering how, like, how much gas we had on the, on the boat. I really didn't know. So, uh, but we went pretty far one time. Larry was kind enough to take us halfway to Japan. Um, and the, the swells, we're on a 20-foot boat. Y'all do this physics in your head, okay? 20-foot boat and 20-foot swells. <laughs> woo <-hoo. laughs> Now, I didn't take, uh, but Dramamine, the first day I was in Ketchikan, I don't know why, I just took it. I was like, I'm looking at water, I need one. And, and so I, I took Dramamine the first day, but that was the last day I took it, and I actually got my sea legs. I felt pretty good, actually. And then I still had my sea legs three days when I got home. It was horrible. I even uh, texted Larry, I was like, when does it quit? The, the boat has to stop rocking at some point in my life. When does it quit? He's like, drink water, it'll quit today. And it did. So it, it definitely, I got my sea legs, so 20-foot swells weren't bad. But it's one of those where I'm following Larry in his boat. And, and you know, there he is. And there he, there he goes. <laughs> there he is. And there he goes. Oh, there he is. There he is. You know, and you, you have to move directions because you can't, you can't really follow in a 20-foot swell. So it's, it, it was quite interesting. So they gave us these little uh, GPS Garmin systems. You know, it's kind of like having the Bible um, where you, you, could, you could actually understand your path a little bit better. And there was like a, a, a navigation, a trace. So if I was on the boat and I went to a certain point on the map, it, it traced me. And so if the fog came in and I couldn't see a thing, I could trace myself back, which was really cool. You know what it's like to go on a boat really fast and not actually see anything in front of you? And you know that there's whales that pop up? <laughs> Guys, we saw like 25 whales. We saw whales popping up everywhere. So, And you're just like... I'm like intensely looking in front of the fog going, I'm, I know there's going to be one. I know there's going to be one. I'm going to, we were joking about it quite a bit because literally there, there were a lot of really cool uh, sites with whales and stuff like that. And of course, the adventure in me it, it sees a whale and what do I do? Oh, hey, let's go chase it. So I, I stop and I go chase the whale to try to get as close as we can, you know, to take pictures. And then when it goes under the water, you're always kind of like, where'd it go? <laughs> Surely it won't breach on the boat. That would hurt it. It wouldn't. It would think. It would think better than that. It wouldn't breach on the boat. And then we found this. You know, once again, a, a Instagram kind of thing afterwards, where a whale breached on the boat. And and Luke and Cody were like, I really think that was getting ready to happen to us. So anyway, we we had some fun adventures like that. But the 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 GPS was super important to us, and that tracking system allowed us to get back. A Bible is super important to us, and it gives a tracking system to help us get back to our true north. So just saying there's some correlations here. It's not just about fun and games on the fishing trip, even though it was really fun and we had a lot of game to catch, but we, we, we actually uh, learned some things from it. And so I think it very much applies to us today. So let's go to the next one real quick. And I, I, you know, I mentioned preparation. And I mentioned um, us getting ready for this trip. Another really cool picture. That's actually the 20-foot boat right there. Yeah, 20-foot swells. Um, so we, we had to prepare for this, right? Going to Alaska is a little bit different than the summer here in Austin. So, like, the weather is, you know, 50 degrees and rainy, and so it's cold, and the water's in the 50s, you know. So you're, you're literally, you know, putting on long johns. You're putting on uh, – it's raining a lot. And I, I didn't realize how um, – sorry if this uh, makes people upset, but I didn't realize how gory fishing was to this level. Because, you know, I've, I've fished and I've done some stuff, but this is like – you're constantly bringing fish in and constantly hitting them on the head, and you're constantly pulling their gills out so they bleed to death so the meat's better. So there's, there's literally like, is this, 
<laughs> yeah, so the meat's better that you eat. Yeah, so it, it's better that way. But it literally, like, it's like a blood fast. <laughs> so we found out that the pink salmon bleed a lot more than the silver salmon. Literally, like, we're just covered. So rain gear is definitely something you want to have. And the boys, uh, it was like, you know, it's not hot out. I'm not wearing my rain, or not cold out. I'm not wearing my rain gear. So the first day they didn't wear their rain jacket. They just had their nice little cotton hoodies on. You ever seen like blood just all over a cotton hoodie before and fish guts and everything else? Because the fish also do other things too. That's kind of gross, but it, it's just disgusting. And so they didn't, they weren't, they, even though they were prepared and bringing their gear, they didn't wear their gear. You know, it's kind of like when you're given the word of God and you know what you're supposed to do and you don't apply it, you get a little, you get a little blood on you. You get a little bit of, and, and they, you know, they poop and they puke and they do all kinds of weird things. Fish do all kinds of stuff. Yeah, this wasn't really a G-rated uh, sermon today, so, uh, but it, it was kind of disgusting, but they had, the, they had the material, they just needed to wear it, put it on, put on. So, you know, I have this, this scripture, right, Ephesians 6, 11 says, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. Y'all know there's schemes against us, right? Y'all realize that once you've, you've been given the word of God, the devil comes to try to steal the word of God. He, he tries to, to, to do that. In fact, there's a scripture. Look this one up. And you'll, you'll enjoy this one too. Um, Hebrews 10.32 talks about that. When we're illuminated, when we're enlightened by the word of God, the devil immediately is going to come to take it away. And if we're not, we have the clothing, we have the armor of God that's been given to us. But if we don't put it on on a regular basis, we're, we're going to have opportunities where we get impacted in a negative way. Just like the boys, when they weren't putting on their gear, even though they brought it with them, they had it in the boat. But they didn't put it on. They were still impacted because of that, making the decision that get so caught up in what was going on that they didn't readjust themselves and get prepared for what was going on. So life presents that opportunity where we can get so consumed and get so caught up and get tangled. That's another scripture. I'll give you another one here. You can look this one up too. Another one on untangling from the world, 2 Timothy 2, 4. Check that one out. We need to untangle ourselves from the world so that we can concentrate on what the plan is, what we're supposed to do, how we're supposed to be prepared, how we're supposed to even mend. That was the other thing in the fishing trip when we went out. You know, it wasn't just about having everything like the tackle. Think of the tackle. We, we got all our tackle together and we went out and we thought we knew what we were doing when we were fishing. And then guess what? Fish change in their appetite. Fish change in what they're looking for. And so you have to adjust. You know, the bait we were using one day was not the same bait we used the next day. And so there was a mending that had to take place and an adjustment that had to take place in order for us to maximize our goal or in order for us to maximize our target. And so that's one of the things God gives us all kinds of scriptures and all kinds of things to live by and some things we need today and some things we'll need tomorrow. And so we need to know how to apply the word of God in our lives. Now, don't just, just throw stuff out, but actually know what you're, you know, understand, have God give revelation to you. The Spirit will come and give us revelation upon which we know how to use and apply the things we're reading. And so when I read my Bible on a daily basis, preparing for myself, I'm asking God, give me some insights, give me some understanding so I know how to apply this and where and when to apply it. Because the devil's scheming against me. He's trying to take what I have learned today and he's trying to take it away. He's trying to counter me. He's trying to entangle me into the world of what the complications are going on or maybe my journey, some of the obstacles, maybe the fog that's setting in. He's trying to distract me in some way. But I got to go back to the truth. I got to go back to what I've learned. I got to go back to, you know, what he's instructing, what he's leading me, what he's guiding me with on today. It's good stuff, huh? So, so we're, 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 we're adjusting uh, our tackle. The fun part of the story was when we were in Ketchikan and we were kind of going uh, to get prepared, one of the things we did is we went to a tackle shop and getting a little bit of extra, you know, tackle <laughs> so we could be prepared. And there's a, the, the guys apparently on this fishing trip, this is like the best season to go fishing for like certain types of fish. So the coho salmon or the silver salmon running in season, awesome time to go fishing for them. Halibut in season, great time to go halibut fishing. Uh, you have pinks running. You have different fish that are running during this period. So it's like a great period to go fishing. And like these hardcore, hardcore like Larry, hardcore fishermen are out there this week. There's 20 of us. And so I feel so much like a rookie with these 20, you know, or 17, I guess, veteran fishermen that are like intense. And so we meet them in Ketchikan and we're at the tackle shop with them and they're they're telling us, to, you know, this works the best. you got to have this. And by the way, halibut fishing, you know, halibut, y'all seen a halibut, right? They're huge. They're like as big as me. 
just a little bit wider. I know I'm wide, but it's a little bit wider than me. And and they're they're you know they can get to the record. I think there was like 400 pounds. So you're bringing up a 400 pit 400 pound fish, and most of them that these guys are trying to catch, the goal is to always get over 100 pounds. That's that's kind of they get a, a little you know thing on their hat when they get a 100 pound fish, and so it's kind of like woo yeah I did it. So these guys are kind of into that as well. Well, the guys that were at the, one of the guys was at the shop, he's totally into halibut fishing. That's all he focused in on. So he's telling us, here's what you need to buy. Here's what you need to get. Here's what you, $400 later. Yeah, well, guys, we didn't get any halibut. Um, <laughs> but I had some really cool halibut tackle. It's really pretty. I thought about hanging it on the wall, like, you know, it's really cool. It's, it's neat stuff. But luckily, I uh, was able to take a lot of it back and get a lot of that money back on the backside of uh, catch a can. So, but anyway, you you are preparing. You're getting ready. What do you need? What do you need clothes wise? What do you need, you know, tackle wise? What do you need? Even food. Think about it this way. One of the cool things this place did was it was self guided. So I probably should have said that we're on our own. <laughs> uh, it's you know me and Cody and Luke on our own on a boat in the sound and the ocean, and uh, you're you're on your own fishing and figuring out to tackle yourself and all those kinds of things. But one of the things they did for us is they provided food, great meals in the morning, 6 a.m. You had to eat together, and 6 p.m. you had to eat together. And so you always had to be back. And, yes, you actually go fishing before 6 a.m. and then come back. So you start pretty early. But you are in Alaska, and there was like two or three hours of darkness. That's it. So it's actually pretty light at 4 a.m. But we would go out, and then we'd come back. And what was really cool is in those sessions where we were eating, people were sharing. They're like, hey, you know, um, this is what worked for me. Go to this spot. You might want to use this kind of tackle. This is how I did it. This is, and everybody's like talking to each other and helping each other kind of get to the goal, which was really cool. Kind of think about the, the body of Christ does that for each other. Like, this is what you should work on. This is what you should work on. This is what, you know, really you need to learn how to drive in black ice. But, you, you know, you, you find ways of, of helping each other and, and really developing each other in different ways. And that's what those guys were doing for us is they were working with us and helping us. And, and helping us develop our technique and our ability. And they were using uh, sound information. And that, as a body of Christ, is what we use. We use sound information to share with each other so that we can help people get back. Sometimes we need help getting back to our true north. Sometimes we need help in understanding the target. Sometimes we need help in understanding what works. Some, some of us need help in our journey of how to tackle an issue. So encouragement and, and a buildup. It's like personal development in that journey that's taking place. And so that, I thought that was just a really cool part of what was going on. Next slide. Let's go to this one. This is a good picture, too. Um, so you got to know your target. Yeah, that's legit. I almost ran into that. Um, so Matthew 6.33 says, But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Sometimes I think we lose track with so much stuff going on in the world today, this fast, world, fast food, I call it, mentality that we have. We sometimes forget that what are we doing here? We're seeking, we're seeking first the kingdom of God, and all these other things will be added to us. Man, we get it backwards sometimes. We go for all the other things, and then we look to seek God. And we're out of order in that perspective. And so we had to reset. When this fishing trip, our target that was we started out, we were talking to Larry. Larry built us up, and we felt like we could do this. Our target was we wanted to go out, and we wanted to get two boxes of fillets for each person coming home. So that's 100 pounds of fillets for each of us. So that's bringing home 300 pounds of meat. That was our goal. We want to bring home 300 pounds of meat. That's a lot of fish to get to 300 pounds of meat. For every fish you catch, you really only get about 40% of the weight. So that'll help you understand how much fish you have to catch to get to 300 pounds of fillet. It's a lot. So we had a strategy. The, the silvers were in. The silver's like the best uh, that you can eat when you, you know, like you're grilling or whatever. And so we really were going after the silvers. And there was a limit. We had to know our limit. We had to understand, uh, you know, the rules upon which we were operating. And the limit was six per person. So we could get six per person per day. So that was always our goal was let's go after the silvers. Let's get six per person per day. And then there was other limits on other kinds of fish. And we always thought if we get those, great. If we get our limit on the silvers, we'll go after the other ones. But our goal is to go after silvers, and then we'll let the rest of the stuff fly. If we get our silvers, we'll go after halibut. If we get our silvers, we'll go after black bass. That's another great fish to eat. So we just kind of had that rule set as we went out every day. So day one, when day one comes, so I told you that crazy ride into the place. So day one was a little bit uh, disrupted. We didn't have as much fishing time. So we go out day one, 
and we go kind of in a shorter area. We didn't want to drive in the boat forever. We just went closer to the, the place, and we're getting all our setup ready. And remember, our setup, you know, you're trolling, and we learned how to troll. We learned how to rig it. Larry was uh, nice enough to take us to Lake Georgetown, Cody and myself, and he taught us how to troll, and he taught us the rigging setup, and he taught us how chaotic it can be. And so he, he was showing us, here's how you do it, here's how it's rigged, here's the knots you tie, here's, here's what happens when you get a fish on. There's actually a little bit of a, a dance almost that takes place, you know. The person catching the fish gets it into a certain point, and then they move back. The person that's going to catch the fish comes in with the net. They get on the end. You bring it in. It's simple. No problem, right? It's easy. So we're like in Georgetown, not catching fish. We're just, play, you know, role playing. Yeah, no problem. Cody and I are like, we got it. That was funny, too, because Larry's so funny. When we were out there in Georgetown practicing, Larry's nice enough. He brought us, like, breakfast tacos. We had breakfast tacos. We're eating the breakfast tacos. Larry goes full throttle all the time, and so we, <laughs> we were... We were learning to do it, and we were gonna we were gonna practice this for a little bit, and then we were gonna go try to fish a little bit. And uh, he's like, "All right, you guys got this down." And we're like, "Yeah, we got it down." And uh, me, me, and uh, my brother-in-law Richard were there. We were on the front of the boat, and uh, Cody was on the back of the boat. And uh, he goes, "All right," and he just guns it all the way, full throttle. And I, we almost lost Cody off the back. And and then <laughs> then Cody, I I didn't see this. I just heard Cody say this. Cody's like, at some point, he turns around and he taps. He taps him on the shoulder, and he's like, Larry, your tacos. <laughs> Larry lost his Yeti with all the tacos. <laughs> so, so luckily, we had eaten some, but that was like second round that just went. So, But it was a, he's always full throttle. So Co Cody was just cracking up because he's like, one, he almost lost me, but he definitely lost the tacos. Anyway, so we learn all this, and we get all practiced up, and we're ready to go. We get there day one. We go out. The three of us, we're in the boat by ourselves. We set it all up. We teach Luke how to do it, and we sit there, and we're trolling. It's real pretty. This is really, this is really, oh, that was an eagle. Did you see that? Oh, whale. When do we catch fish? <laughs> so we caught one. Um, that was it that day. So we didn't reach our limit the first day. We caught one fish, and you're kind of re re resetting expectations. Are we still going to get 300 pounds of meat, or are we getting like three <laughs> pounds of meat? We caught one. Although it was cool, kingfish, you can only catch one per person per year. So it was a kingfish. Uh, we didn't know for sure um, the size regulation, so I'm pretty sure it was the right size. At least that's what the guy said when we came in, so we were good with that. But we got one fish that day, and that was it. And so, you know... You're hoping that everybody else had bad luck, too. And so you're at the dinner table, and you're like, how many fish did you catch? We only got eight. And we're like, well, that's better than us, you know. Someone else is like, yeah, we only got like 12. And we're like, okay. <laughs> anyway, there, there was another a couple that was a rookie couple that was a little bit older than us. And we were like, how many did you guys get? And we were hoping they said zero, and they were like three. And we're like, okay, yeah, we we're the worst. So that's terrible. So, you know, we, we're, we're kind of learning and we're kind of adjusting. And, and, um, but our, that was our target and that was our set. Now, the good thing was Larry came with us the next day and kind of got us going. The funny thing about this, once again, Larry's hardcore. And one of the best parts about doing this is like when you get a fish on all three poles at the same time, chaos takes place. Because, I mean, who's reeling what and who's catching what and who's helping with the net and who's got what. And the fish... They, it's not like the fish stay in their own lane. You know, the fish isn't like, oh, I got the left side. I'll just roll up to you here on the left side. No, usually what happens is they're like, oh, I see a fish on that side. I'm going to that side. And the one on that side goes, I'll go over here. And so you got your lines getting all tangled up as you're trying to hold them apart. And so what happens is the ensuing dance in the boat. So if your fish is moving, you're moving with it. And if your fish is moving, you're moving under. And if you've got, the, who's got the net? I don't know. And Larry's sitting in the driver's seat driving the boat laughing the whole time. So, you know, this is our first time to get three fish on, on three reels at the same time. We're all excited. We're all, it's all chaotic. I'm pretty sure um, I was bleeding more than the fish on the first go around. But, uh, yeah, it was like, blood's on the ground. Look, man, you, and I'm like, yeah, that's my hand. That was a hook. So, you know, you have those kinds of things taking place. And then um, we're, we're trying to get, you know, the net and all this kind of stuff. We, we, we had three on, and we never brought one fish in. <laughs> And I'm pretty sure Larry's uh, comment back to us was like, y'all are awful. You're really bad. And we're like, yeah, okay. And so, you know, you, you just, you got to reset, right? You got to re go back to the true north. Uh, what did you get taught? What was your instruction? How did you prepare? How do you leverage that? 
How many of y'all have ever been on a journey where you just, you kind of, you're bad at it, and, and whatever the situation's going on, you're like, man, I just can't figure this out. Teenagers, no. You're, you're, you're trying to, you're struggling, trying to understand things, and, and sometimes you got to go back to the true north and say, okay, these, this is the preparation I had for this, and I'm going back to it, and it says, oh, yeah, okay, I got to cast my cares. <laughs> I got to reset myself. Just a little bit. So we had those kinds of things. But the good news is we reset. That day, it was kind of cool. I think it was a little bit of a a proud moment for Larry. He was pretty excited. We reached our limit in silvers for all of us, all four. So we ended up with like 24 uh, salmon plus like a bunch of uh, pinks. And we ended up with some uh, black bass. Cody caught a link cod, which I should have put a picture up there. Nasty, ugly fish, huge fish. He thought he had a halibut. We're all excited. And he brings it up. We're like, ugh. And, and Larry's like, oh, that's good to eat. And we're like, all right, yeah, way to go. Caught a bunch of fish we couldn't keep. You know, it was just interesting. A lot of poisonous fish. That was fun, catching the poisonous fish, and you're, you're trying to get them off the hook without touching the poison, you know, in the, in the fin. That was fun. So we, we, we caught all kinds of things, and the experience that day was much better. We hit our target that day, and it felt so much better uh, to kind of hit our target. And so we had to... We had moments, though, in our trip where we got a little distracted in chasing (laughs) whales. We had moments in our trip where we got a little distracted in trying things we probably shouldn't have been trying. We got distracted in, you know, sightseeing. There were some really pretty areas. We We got a little distracted at times off of our target, and we had to reset ourselves. The other thing that always was a little bit hard for us is when you come back at 6 a.m. to eat breakfast, and, you know, these dudes are pulling off these 100-pound halibuts and hoisting them up, taking pictures, and you're like, Let's go after halibut. And we're like, no, that wasn't our goal. That wasn't our goal. But we had to remind ourselves what we were good at and what we were prepared for and what we needed to go after. And don't be so envious of what they're doing. Focus in on what your plan and, and your kind of position and what you prepared for. How many times in life do we do that? Oh, man, I really like what they're doing. Larry goes to Alaska every year. I want to do that. You know, it's like you've you got to reset. You've got a purpose and plan that's important. And we need to fulfill that. And so sometimes we get distracted by all these things. we got to know our target and go after our target. So let's go to the next one. Only like 173 left. So execute, communicate, and adjust. I love this part because, man, you know, it, uh, when I at work, when I'm talking leadership, I told you I used some of these principles in a leadership meeting this week. And that is the biggest thing when I'm talking to these engineers, when I'm talking to these salespeople, when I'm talking to these, I'm telling you, man, it's about execution. You, you, sometimes you set up a plan, you get yourself prepared, you know your true north, you know your guidance on, on how to adjust and mend when needed, but man, sometimes you don't just execute it. Have you all ever found that in a journey that you're on where you just don't execute what you know? You can say it even. Like, have you ever been around where you can recite the word of God? But then you're like, why am I not following the word of God? It's one thing to cite it. It's another thing to act upon it. And so that was part of it we had to do was we had to, we had to, actually, we had to actually act upon the plan, act upon the preparation, act upon the mending, actually do the mending. We had to, you know, understand uh, what, what had been given to us and how we were set. We need to understand the word of God, what's been given to us, how it applies to us as the Holy Spirit leads, and then how, how do we follow it? How do we execute Communication was key, too. I told you about the, the opportunities for those guys to kind of give us instruction and kind of give, you know, back and forth instruction. That was super important. We had radios on the boats. And on the boats, we would, we would talk to each other. We would, we would say, hey, and it was always fun because the, the, um, the place we stayed at, they, they wanted to make it secret. So, like, the name of a spot, like I told you, was Clump Island. Instead of calling it Clump Island on the radio, we'd be like, C. And, and you know, another one would be like... Um, Port Alice, that would be B. And so, you know, we had different numbers, and it was code because when you're fishing out there in the sound, there's uh, commercial trollers, and then there's, uh, you know, uh, commercial guides that come in. And so if you tell somebody, hey, I'm catching a lot of fish at Clump, you know, all of a sudden everybody's at Clump, like literally everybody, all the commercial fishermen, everybody's at Clump, and it just got real busy real quick. So they had this kind of even way of speaking to each other. How many of y'all know God has a Holy Spirit that speaks a little unique to us? 
and it's for us. And it's not necessarily for everybody to hear sometimes how he leads us and guides us. So he has his own unique way of speaking to us, and we have to listen to it. We have to understand it. It was one thing. I was on there, and he was talking to me one time. I was boat four. He's like, boat four, blah, 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 because Luke was leaving a day early, and they wanted to confirm, you know, the fish that he caught. Is it going with me or is it going with Luke? So they're like, boat four, we need to know, blah, 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 blah. Man, I am so into whatever we were doing, I didn't pay attention. Boat four, and someone came back, and boat four ever answer? And I'm like, oh, that's us. <laughs> we're boat four. It's used to buddy, you know. But so I was, you know, I had to respond. I had to pick. I wasn't paying attention. Uh, you know, sometimes we don't pay attention to the Holy Spirit. And sometimes someone else comes in and says, did you, did you listen? Have you ever had that happen? Yeah, we had that on the boat. So we had the opportunities to kind of shape up and, and communicate. And, and uh, even in our own function of working together, if we, we, we always yelled, fish on the left, right side, center. I got the net. I got the boat. I'm going to stop the boat. I'm trolling. I'm not trolling. I got it. Pull this. Grab the fish. Hit the hammer. Get the hammer. Get the hammer. Hit it. You know, it's like, get your hand off the hook. We had different, but we were always talking and always communicating, much like a sports team would. Like if you're in basketball, they always say you got to be talking all the time. What's going on? What's taking place? That's part of the game. That was part of us. That's part of our journey is we have to be communicating to God. If you're not talking to God every day, you're hooking yourself. It won't work. You're not catching the fish. You, you, ha you have to pray. You have to read the Bible. You have to be communicating to God. If we went out there and we didn't have the communication, mm -mm, we wouldn't have been as successful in our endeavors. And I'll tell you what, too, the, the other piece that's, that was nice was they would even point out when you saw a whale in the water, it meant the whale was eating the krill. The krill, is, you know, there's fish and there's little fish, there's big fish. And so it, whenever you saw a whale, that is a good sign there's fish in the area. And so they would even point that out to you. Hey, there's a whale, you know, and, and then you, you would find out the area and you kind of understand where to go to. So it was fun. Even one day we had um, uh, Larry turned us on to something. We had a hard time catching the, 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 the black bass. Black bass is a rock fish that sit at the bottom. And if you're not fishing at the bottom, we were doing a lot of trolling, so we were up at the top a little bit more. Uh, but if you're not fishing at the bottom, it's hard to catch the black bass. We wanted some black bass because it's really good to eat, and so we were trying to catch it. So Larry turned us on. There's a school. He's like, there's a school of black bass. Drive up on it, and you'll see it. And so we drove up on this, and we see them. They're up on the surface of the water, and we're all excited. We're like, yes. So, you know, we're not quite the seasoned, mature fishermen. So, of course, we're like, pull out the fly rod. This will be fun. And so, you know, you don't usually fly rod in the ocean like this, but we decided we would try it. So we, we got, and the fly rods are a little bit more flexible. You can break them a little bit easier, that kind of stuff. So we're now fly fishing in the middle of the ocean for these black bass that are sitting on the top, and we're nailing them, just one after the other, so fast that we're just basically dropping them in the boat, throwing out, catching another one, dropping them in the boat. We're not even hitting them. They're flopping everywhere, We, you know, and our limit's like 15, so we're just going as fast as we can, and then the fish would go down, and then we're like, all right, where'd they go? And then they pop up 20 yards over here, and Cody's driving the boat. Cody's like, you know, we're, we're at 3 o'clock, 3 o'clock, and he drive the boat over, and we're all of a sudden, we're casting again. Me and Luke are catching more fish, throwing the fish in the boat. We got fish everywhere, just, and so this is fun. We're having a blast. But, like, there's a lot of other boaters, like, doing real fishing, trolling, and, you know, fishing the right way. We're fishing probably the wrong way, and everybody's kind of looking at us. And we keep on doing this, and then one time Cody's going towards it. It's like 12 o'clock. There's the school. Cody's driving up to 12 o'clock, and a whale breached right in front of him. He almost hit the whale. So we're, we're all slowing down a little bit. We're doing it. But we're, we're all excited, so we're on the radio. That's another one on the fly. We caught a pink on the fly. We're, we're getting all excited, you know, because we're, we're doing it. But I'm sure we look, you know, hilarious to to everybody else that's out there. So by day five, I will tell you, but the execution and the communication and our ability to adjust and be a little bit more agile in our approach, there were many more times where we had three fish on at the same time, and we landed them perfect. And one of the best ones, my favorite one, in fact, was, um, in fact, I, we ended our fishing trip landing three on at the same time. That's how we actually ended the trip. It was, it was super cool to end it that way, too. But one of my favorites, we were driving down, and there was two commercial guys. We were out there first fishing this area, and these two commercial guys come up with these guide fishermen. And, and these guide fishermen, you know, I feel sorry for them because they can't bait their own hook. 
they can drop it, and all they're doing is mooching. They're just dropping the line, and they're just, you know, when they get a fish, they pull it in. They're not allowed to touch the fish. They're not allowed to net the fish. They're not allowed to do. So they're just dropping a line, letting it go, and then reeling it in. That's all they get to do. And there's a boat full of them on this side and a boat full of them on this side. We go right through the middle of them, land three on at the same time, and we are hauling these fish in, and we drop the, because Larry was always like, as soon as you catch the fish, you need to be back in the water to catch more fish. I, I think it took us like five minutes to reel those fish in, catch them on, and get the bait back in the water. And we just kept on sailing right past those guys, and they all were doing this. So we went from being really bad to being actually pretty good out there, and we, we actually uh, did a nice job. You can go to the next slide. We actually got uh, a nice amount of fish. This was one day's catch. In the, the middle is the link cod. And then that's Larry over on the left. That's Luke and then Cody and then myself. But there, there is a reward when you follow this. There is a reward when you prepare yourself and you follow the instructions. It, that, that journey took us a little bit. We went from catching one fish to catching that every day. And so, we, you know, we actually gained respect from the veteran fishermen that were there. They're like, you guys are holding your own, you know, and not too bad. We walked away with 300 pounds of fillets. So we got fish afterwards. No, I'm just kidding. We should do that. But we, we did walk away with 300 pounds of meat. So we, we, we absolutely hit the target that we were going after. But I love this scripture. It says this in Revelations. Behold, I am coming soon, bringing my re, uh, recompense with me to repay each one for what he has done. Recompense meaning reward. Recompense meaning restoration. He's bringing back that to reward us for those who listen to him, who abide by his word, who listen to the journey he has prepared for us, who actually enable his Holy Spirit to be leveraged in our life, who find ways to mend. Remember, we had to mend the whole trip. We had to change our clothes. We had to change our approach. We had to change our bait. We had to change our attitude. We had to change many things to be successful. Well, guess what? Our journey in life is the same way, and God can help us mend. In this case, the fishermen helped us mend. In this case, God, the ultimate fisher of men, is, is trying to do just that. He's trying to help us understand. He's trying to help us be there. So I have this statement. I saw it. I thought it was really cool. What, we always kind of take the approach with the word of God and with God himself, and we always say, what can he do for me? Have you ever done that? What can God do for me in this scenario? What can God do for me in this situation? What can God do for me in my journey? What can God do? And maybe we should start to be thinking, what does he desire of me? What am I supposed to learn from this? What am I supposed to approach? How am I supposed to be an impact to others? How am I supposed to apply this? How am I supposed to grow? How am I supposed to develop? Anyway, Super cool uh, experience in doing that and achieving the reward, ultimately, the success of the journey, if you will, taught us a lot. Now, we, we were hurting at the end. We were tired. Mentally, awesome. Physically, wore out. <laughs> hurting, man, we had so many cuts on our hands. It hurt to just, like, run water over our hands because the braided lines, as you're grabbing the lines constantly for five days, you, you end up with these slices in your hand, like paper cut deep slices all throughout your hand everywhere. And we tried wearing gloves, trying not wearing gloves. This was really hard to do, you know, but we were hurting in a lot of different ways. And then we stunk so bad. <laughs> it was so awful. In fact, one of uh, Rob, um, Josh's friend that was there with us, his bag was so nasty. And when we got to catch a can, he ditched it and got a new bag. It was awful. I, I literally grabbed it out of the van and I was like, man, that thing is horrid. When that gets in an airplane, it is going to stink up everything. We were so nasty smelling. And, you know, you got five days of fish guts and everything else getting on you, and, and then it, you never really wash it off. So it was, uh, it was quite the experience in that regard. Luckily, Cody and I found a, um, uh, at the Ketchikan, once again, spending the night on our way out because of weather, we found a nice uh, washer and dryer that we could at least throw the rain gear in that was so disgusting and you're welcome because we ran it through twice and it still was kind of smelly but it was definitely a lot lower level of intensity uh, than it could have been but we learned a lot we experienced a lot we got to see a lot we got to understand a lot for me it creates applications in life upon leadership skills as well as life lessons but I such a correlation to the word of God such a correlation to the journey that God has us on he put us on an adventure. All of you like adventure to some degree in different ways, but God put us on a, on a journey, on a trip uh, for this adventure. 
The last one I have for you, last slide I have for you is, is an important one I think that we have to. A key for me is, see this tranquil kind of look? That's me, by the way. Um, I'm, I'm trying to bottom fish. So I've cast. So the, the fun part about um, halibut fishing is you, you, you just sit. Like uh, the gentleman I was telling you about that loved the uh, halibut fish and got me to buy $400 worth of gear uh, that I didn't use really well. Um, him and his dad would go out. His dad was 83 years old. Him and his dad would go out halibut fishing all day long, and they would uh, turn on audiobooks, and they would just sit there and fish. And at times, if the tides weren't changing and too crazy, they could just turn the motor off and just sit there and fish. Now, I had two, you know, adrenaline junkies with me that weren't going to allow me to turn the boat off and listen to an audio book and fish. But, but it was nice to be able to kind of sit and try that every once in a while. And, ca and when you're casting, you're, you're not throwing it. You're just dropping it. So you got this heavy weight. You, we call them can cannonballs. They're like some are two pounds, three pounds. And you're dropping these things, and they just go to the bottom. And when you fish for halibut, you're fishing on pinnacles. So the, the ground below you comes up to a dome. And those halibut kind of sit on the edge of that dome and they're feeding as, as you know, food comes across that dome, they're feeding on that dome. And so you look for these pinnacles out there and you're fishing on these pinnacles. And the only, <laughs> the only part that's really hard is like, you're, they're deep. Like some are 250 feet deep, some are 300 foot deep. So you're dropping a three pound ball, 350 foot deep. And when you need to adjust, you gotta reel that three pound ball up 20 minutes later, when you get it to the top, then you send it back down again. So it's, there's some work involved just in mending the line and, deep, and fishing deep sometimes. And so, you know, it was fun to be able to, to cast it. It's definitely not fun to carry it. So this is a uh, Rick Renner. Um, you guys know who Rick Renner is? He's got uh, these books on, uh, what is it called, gems, sparkling gems. And he does these devotionals super into the Greek, uh, and he, and he uh, takes scripture, and he gives you the Greek meaning behind it, gives you the true meaning and the emphasis behind the words. And so he did that uh, with this scripture about casting your cares. And I really, really like it. So the scripture itself, I forgot to write it up there for you guys. I apologize, but it's First Peter 5, 7. It's just the scripture itself says, casting all your cares upon him, for he careth for you. But Rick, I love his, his kind of, once you uh, interpret the Greek meaning of these words, he paraphrases it back and says this is the true meaning of what he's trying to say in the scripture. So this is, this is really how it should come across to us. Take that heavy burden, that difficulty or challenge that you are carrying, the one that has arisen due to circumstances that have created hardship and struggles in your life, and fling those worries and anxieties over onto the back of the Lord. Let him carry them for you. The Lord is extremely interested in every facet of your life and is genuinely concerned about your welfare. And he goes on in his uh, devotional to talk about, you know, we weren't made to carry the stresses and anxieties of this world. You're not. You're not. You, it never was intended for you to carry it. You can't. You physically aren't made to carry it. You have to learn to cast your cares. You have to learn to do exactly what he's talking about. And when he talks about throwing it over the back of the Lord, the reference of the term that's used in the scripture is the same reference when they were throwing um, the, um, the clothes and stuff on the, on the colt, on the donkey. It's the same reference. And when they throw, they throw the, the, you know, the burdens or the weights onto the donkey, same thing, that the same word was used here, throwing and casting our cares upon him so that he can carry it instead of us. So just like my fishing trip, easy to cast, really hard to carry the burden back up. So, you know, good illustration, once again. In fact, when I was going back to, go back to the story, the last day we hit those 20-foot swells, um, they were going out to fish halibut. And uh, I started looking on the map, because once again, you have a depth finder with you. And I'm looking on the map as we're going to Japan, that some of these areas are like super deep. I'm like, guys, you know, it's hard to keep up with Larry, but also the, the depth of some of this stuff's like 350 feet deep. That's going to take us like a half an hour to reel this baby up. And then, and then once again, at the swells, so if you're on the bottom, you know, as the swell comes in, you're 20 foot off the bottom. Then you're on the bottom, then you're 20 foot off the bottom. So it's constantly adjusting at a pretty rapid rate. So we quickly moved away and said, you all have fun uh, fishing for halibut. Let us know if you get one. We're going to go back and look for something else. So we, we made it off the 20 foot swells there after a little bit. But once again, the point being, um, if, you're, if you're pulling 
and you're bur- you know you're trying to carry that burden and trying to take care of that burden it's a, it's a it's a tough haul it, it takes away from the opportunity of hitting targets that's how we viewed it we were viewing it as um, you know us trying to you know continually mend the halibut line continue to pull it up was taking away from our time to achieve other targets that we were really prepared for and we were positioned for and so we kind of backed away and kind of focused in on the things that we prepped for Once again, know your target, understand your focus, execute, communicate, uh, and continue to adjust. Anyway, that that was it. That's that's all I really uh, had to share today. But I I hope hopefully you got something out of it. It's a good. It's always good, in my opinion, to tell a story and relate it. And I know most of you, uh, or some of you, may not be into fishing, and some of you may be into fishing. That's okay. The point was in the illustrations, you can see God at work. You know, he's he's that way in everything. God's inside of everything. If you start to look at how the earth functions, you see God. If you start to look at your journeys that you have in life, you see God. But but you have to look for him. You you definitely have to try to understand it. And once again, if you're not in the word and you're not praying and you're not communicating with God, it gets hard to get back on that true north. It's hard to stay mending the right way. It's hard to change and adjust so that you can hit your targets. And so I encourage you guys today, continue to embrace God. If you get anything out of this message today, it's that fear of the Lord, how powerful it is. I'll remind you once again, I just love, you know, how, how it kind of, and once again, he, the fear of the Lord is enduring forever. It can be taught. It's the beginning of wisdom. It leads to the knowledge of God. It prolongs life. It provides confidence. It is security. It leads to life. It leads to satisfaction. It gives you rest It gives you safety. It provides riches. It provides honor. It provides life everlasting. Awesome, huh? Stand to your feet. Such a cool way to think about God, isn't it? In regards to he cares for us. I love what it says there. He cares for us. The Lord is extremely interested in every facet of your life and is genuinely concerned about your welfare awesome, isn't it? Such a cool, cool representation of of his love for us. Awesome. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this, this time together today. We thank you for what you're doing in our lives. We thank you, Father God, that you give us a purpose. You give us a journey, Father God. You give us adventure. You give us insights. You give us wisdom. You give us knowledge. You give us preparation. You mend us, Father God. You've given us your word that gives us the rules and the guidance upon which we can leverage and use. You've given us a true compass, Jesus, your son who died on the cross, the most consistent, the only consistent truth in this world. Father God, we thank you for what you've given us. Sorry, Father God, that we haven't applied it as best we can, but we're continuing to grow and we're continuing to adjust and we're continuing to mend ourselves so that we can be more Christ-like in you, Father God. Thank you for being patient with us. Thank you for genuinely caring for our welfare. Thank you for giving us a way to cast our cares that we don't have to carry this. You've made the burden easy for us to embrace. We just have to embrace you, Father God. Thank you for creating all of this. You are truly our savior. You're truly our inspiration. You truly are our leader upon which we want to follow. Thank you, Father God, for what you're doing in our lives today. Let us leave here not the same. Let us be transformed by the renewing of our mind in you, Father God, in your word and what you've given us. Continue to grow us, Father God, as we dig in each and every day. Give us insights. Holy Spirit, lead us and guide us to our targets and to our plan that you have for us. We want to achieve the mission. We want to achieve the target. And we may not be perfect, but we will get better. We will grow in you, Father God. We will develop, and we will achieve what you've set out for us as long as we remain focused in on our true north, you, Father God. Thank you for today. Thank you for all that's being said. Thank you for giving us the ability to share this message, Father God, with others. Thank you that through us, others will get to know you, Father God, your love and what you're doing and capable of doing for them, Father God. Thank you for this day. Thank you for 
Pastor Steve and Pastor Kim and the family, Father God, thank you for being with them. Thank you for strengthening them. Thank you, Father God, for giving them an opportunity to minister to such a great community. And thank you, Father God, for blessing us today with your word. We thank you. We honor you. We praise you. We adore you. We love you. We thank you, Father God, for what you're doing. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. Real quick, if you would please close your eyes one more time. Hallelujah. But he said it in his teaching today. The question is, what does the Lord desire for me? His desire for you is that you live eternally in heaven. There is a heaven to gain and a hell to shun. And I just don't want to close without giving an opportunity. If everyone could please just close your eyes. If you've never received the Lord as your personal Savior, if you've never said, Jesus, be my Lord, I want to encourage you right now to slip your hand up real quick. We want to pray with you. We want to believe with you. The Word of God says that if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that He is your Lord and your Savior, He'll come in. He'll be the Savior of your life. You turn from your ways, and He'll change your life like you've never seen before. Hallelujah. Anybody here never received the Lord as your Savior? Maybe you've received Him before, and you've been away from Him. You've not been living for Him. And you want to come back. You want to come back home. So I'm, if you, that's you, just lift your hand right now. It's important that we do this. Man, we don't know how much time we have. <laughs> time is short. We can see. We can tell that. Hallelujah. Anybody like that in the room? Lift your hand real quick. Thank you, Lord. Yes. Hallelujah. All right. I want to encourage you. Uh, if you have any needs in your life, anything you would like for us to be praying with you about, we have altar care people up here that would be so happy to join with you and pray with you. And if you lit, raised your hand or wanted to raise your hand, you didn't for salvation or you want to come back to the Lord, I encourage you to come up and allow one of our altar care people to pray with you. Praise God. Wasn't it good today? Amen. Well, turn back there and say, we miss you, Pastor Steve. We love you. We'll see you back here on Sunday. We love you all so much. Don't forget, we have service on Wednesday. It's an hour of power. You need a refilling in the middle of your week. I encourage you to come out Wednesday, 7 to 8 o'clock. We're going to have an awesome time. Love somebody on the way out. Have a glorious day. Share the love of Jesus. Put a smile on your face. Hallelujah. The joy of the Lord is your strength. You're dismissed.